Hello, welcome to Mod Midwives, a Metro Midwifery podcast. I'm Gina Gerboff. And I'm Nedra Hale, and we are home birth midwives serving the Denver metro area. So what's been up with you this weekend? I am moving rooms around still, again, continuing. And uh, so I spent the weekend digging out the basement a little bit. And so just to catch you up, we moved dad out to his apartment in the garage and then um the two youngest kids and i moved back upstairs and then finley and i switched rooms so it's just been you know total disaster of things everywhere i mean if you were going to switch rooms it's a good idea i mean it's good that it sort of all happened at this time yeah because the room he was in was empty you know so then we moved everything over um but as you can see, I have no decor on my I wall. Know. <laughs> it's so funny because like, that's a bad thing for you, but I like the minimalist look. So oh. <laughs> I'm like, I think it looks great. <laughs> Whereas you can see all the disaster behind me, which I is know, actually- I know, and I was looking at your wall part. thinking, oh, look, at, it's so pretty. You've got all the, you've got the pictures and the lights and all that stuff. And, and the foam so roller much. and the- Oh, it's a foam roller back there, yeah. <laughs> So it's not that great. Anyway, we are going to YouTube these. So if anybody wants to see my foam roller, it's on YouTube. Yes, it's blue. Very nice. Yeah. Um, well, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. It, it, everything's always a lot of work. Why is everything so much work all the time? I don't know. And I'm just so over it. And, and at the same time, there's like a thousand projects that I still need to do. So I'm just like, okay, you know, let me finish this thing so I can paint this thing so I can do this thing. And it's just like, ah, it never That's ends. A lot. <laughs> yeah. I ended up with postpartum visits both days this weekend. I had a, um, IV clinical. I'm doing an IV class with the EMT program and had an IV clinical, but that was fun. I mean, it was, it was eight hours that I didn't really have available. And then, you know, of course I wasn't able to do the second one because of work stuff, but, um, but I uh, really enjoyed the experience. It was kind of fun. It sounded fun. I was really jealous. Yeah. But I just don't really have time for it. That's the <laughs> that's the bottom right. line. I mean, I was not jealous of the you know four or five hour classes on weeknights. No, thank you. <laughs> no, four hours for six nights, and then <clears throat> and then eight hour clinical. So, but I feel I feel really good about the progress I made. So, you know, we just don't do that many IVs in a home birth practice. It's just not our it's not our forte. So I'm pretty pretty excited to get some more practice and hands on stuff going on. So we are going to do a three-part series for the podcast. Um, They are going to be, the three parts are going to be the three stages of labor. And tonight we will start with stage one for for the labor part of it. And then the difference between this is that instead of just being, you know, physiologically what's happening, it's going to be more like what should the family be doing and what should the midwives be doing? So it's centered both towards... um, you know, uh, midwifery instruction and childbirth education. So it's kind of um, a little bit for everybody, hopefully, in in the limited time that we have. But so do you want to start off by talking about what's going on in the first stage of labor? Sure. So the first stage is when the cervix is opening and thinning and all of, I guess I should have said thinning first. Softening. Usually. usually. I mean, not always. (laughs) opening and so the muscles of the uterus which are really cool and you know there's muscles that go different directions and do different stuff um in this stage the muscles are working to pull the cervix open and thin it and um, when I was teaching childbirth classes I would always do that visual of it being like a turtleneck sweater so it's like here's the baby's head and like you know (laughs) yep And that's actually really good because it actually kind of showed, actually, I guess it was the other way, but the cervix can almost be like a funnel where it right. kind of, you know, here it's really closed and then it starts to open <laughs> like that. And then yes. oh, good YouTube stuff here, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but so it's a great the, analogy. Pulling the turtleneck yeah. over the head is a great analogy. 
So, and then during this time, what the laboring person is experiencing is the sensation of those contractions that are coming in some kind of regular pattern. Sometimes they start out really far apart, like 10 minutes apart or more, and then they get closer together and stronger and longer. And then, you know, it just gets progressively more intense as we get closer to 10 centimeters, the magic number. Yeah. And there can be stuff that happens before the first stage that is still mm -hmm. preparing the body for birth, but it's not until contractions um, form a pattern that gets longer, stronger, and closer together. The contractions get longer, stronger, and closer together that we really call it labor. So right. anything before that pattern of longer, stronger, and closer together is established as like prodromal or pre-labor. It's not actually labor until we're kind of ramping up in some way. Right. Labor should culminate in the birth of a baby. The birth. <laughs> yes. Yes. So even you hear people all the time saying that they were in labor for six yes. days or you know, whatever. And it's it's no, it's no, that's not it. It's it's prodromal. If it goes on for that long, it should not. Yeah. I mean, after. you can have a non-progressing labor or an arrest of labor, but mm -hmm. usually we're talking about this kind of pattern happening before the onset of regular contractions that get longer, stronger, closer together. And the other quality that we talk about is painful contractions that get longer, stronger, and closer together. Mm -hmm. um, that is, of course, somewhat of a loaded term because many people don't like to think of the sensations of labor as being painful. Right. Um, I just think that if you have that expectation, you're likely to be sorely disappointed. And so I think expecting them to be painful is probably a way to set yourself up with a realistic expectation. Yes, agreed. I mean, you can say you're working really hard, it's muscle sensations, it's, you know, like running a marathon, your legs are cramping up or, you know, something like that. But it is for most people incredibly uncomfortable and probably painful. I mean, Braxton Hicks contractions, which many of you may know are non-productive contractions. They don't change your cervix. They can also be feel like an intense muscle activity. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be something more than that for it to be a productive right. labor contraction. Right. Um, so, you know, it's uh, philosophical. It's maybe a philosophical question about how you want to describe it, but I think it's, um, for most people, you could say painful contractions that are getting longer, stronger, and closer together are where we call the onset of labor. Yep. Um, many people go into labor expecting that their water breaking will be the first thing that happens, um, that the water breaks and the contractions start, but that's actually rare. That's not, or not rare. It's less common. I think it only happens between 10 and 15% of the time that your water breaks as the first, you know, Science I was going to ask if we had a statistic on that because I know it just doesn't happen very often, but it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it happens. Rare is not a right, mm -hmm. is not the right descriptor, but, but it's definitely less common. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and this isn't necessarily the birthing person, but the partner often that's like, wait, her water hasn't even broken yet. And, you know, of course it's not right. really related at all. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So what, well, maybe before we go into the next phase, we should talk to about um, the first stage of labor is further broken up into different phases. Um, so, so basically we're getting the cervix usually from, you know, long, hard and closed. So zero centimeters dilated, zero percent effaced and firm to very, very stretchy, 100 percent effaced and 10 centimeters dilated is, is basically where the cervix is going away. We have nothing but a baby's head um, when we check. We don't feel any cervix. Um, so that's a lot. That's a lot of work. The cervix is the neck of the uterus. It's a very firm piece of muscle, I guess, for lack of a better section of muscle. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of work to get that kind of change from a muscle. So right. that's yeah. So it's so it's um still a process. That's a big process. So starting labor is only the very very first step. There's still a long way to go. Right. And you can imagine that like making that much change happen would be uncomfortable. Right. 
Totally. <laughs> um, so the first phase of labor is called early labor. And early labor would be where we have the onset of contractions that are in a progressive pattern, um, usually until six centimeters dilated. So that's the kind of ACOG definition is six centimeters. Or latent is the other word. Yeah, early or latent labor. Yeah, you tend to use latent. I think it does depend on where you were trained. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always say early, but I think that you're, um, I think latent is probably more of the technical term. Um, yeah, so six centimeters is quite a ways into labor. And so there's most of the work to be done in the, in the earlier latent phase of labor, mm -hmm. for sure. So what would you recommend for the birthing person in early labor? Well, this is where we usually advise that you try your best to ignore it and go about your normal activities because one, there's not much you can do to affect change on what's happening. So you can't really like walk around the block and speed it up usually, um, eh, maybe a little bit, but it doesn't stick. You know, it's, it's like it works while you're doing it, but it doesn't stick. And um, you exhaust yourself. And this period can last for a long time. It can last, you know, like 18 hours, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it's completely variable, hard to predict. And um, so you should rest. If it's at night, you should sleep. You should just do what you normally do. If you would normally eat dinner, eat dinner. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the way that you always say that. I still say you should try to nap during the day because chances are you're not going to get a great night's sleep if it's early in the Good day. Mm -hmm. So even though it's, um, but you don't have to sleep all day. That's probably not realistic for most people. Um, but try to take a nap. Um, we absolutely can keep things going and help labor move along in active labor by being active, by helping with position changes and all of that. But that's not the case in early labor. Early labor contractions are dependent upon what you're doing. So it might be that in one position, you have really regular contractions. They might even be every three minutes apart, but maybe 30 seconds long. And then you change positions and they spread out to 10 minutes apart. That's a sign that you are not in active labor yet. It's still early if they change based on your activity. Right. So right. I usually, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Sorry. I was just going <laughs> to say, it's a good, it's a good part of labor to do that thing that Dr. Bradley used to say, I don't, I'm paraphrasing because it's been so long since I've actually read his material, but, but it's like, get out of the way of your body. So just stop trying to interfere and just let your body do its thing. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just go along for the ride, basically. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I actually recommend that people try different things in order to test it. So you're testing to see if it's early or active. If you're not sure and you're thinking, I wonder if I'm in active labor. Also, if you're thinking to yourself, I wonder if I'm in active labor, you probably are not. Right. Um, especially if it's your first baby. Right. So that's also a truth. If you're not sure, you're probably not in active labor. Um, the problem is that sometimes if it's a, um, somebody who's had a baby before, um, you can go from, I'm not sure I'm in labor to the baby's out in a pretty short amount of time. So it, there can, it can still be really tricky. Yes. So it's always a, we're always trying to figure out where we're at, but mm -hmm. laying down for a while, taking a bath or a shower, seeing if things slow down, um, that's a good test of your contractions to see if they're an active, in an active pattern or not. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other things that you might see in early labor that you tell people? Um, well, you might have some bloody shows, which is just like stringy, mucusy, bloody stuff. You shouldn't have frank bleeding, which is, you know, like a period. Um, let's see. I mean, you might have some leaking water at some point. I, I would say most of the time I have my clients don't break their water till like close to pushing, but mm -hmm. you know, it can happen anytime. So you might have some leaking water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The bloody show can happen even before early labor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's somebody's first or, you know, losing the mucus plug. Oh, you just did a great blog post on the mucus plug. So go visit the blog for that recent post. But you know, sometimes it is usually though, when it's got blood, in it, it's tinged with blood. That's usually a sign that the cervix is changing. Mm -hmm. And something that you kind of alluded to was that in um, 
for first babies, we usually see that the cervix will completely efface before it starts dilating or really close to it. So we can have in a first time birthing person, a cervix that is 100% effaced, completely thinned out. There's no thickness to the cervix, but it could even be closed mm -hmm. or just a tiny little fingertip indented and open. So um, sometimes the bloody show is happening. The lighter tinge bloody show is happening when the cervix is effacing often with a first mm -hmm. baby. So it can happen early. Um, second time, third time, fourth time, the cervix kind of knows how to shrink down and open at the same time and it just sort of can right. multitask differently so they can stay pretty thick all the way through yeah mm -hmm. yeah till that head comes down really yep. yep um so first stage is really or early labor latent labor is actually um one of the things that's more different in second subsequent pregnancies or labors that that part is much much shorter usually your body does a lot more work in early labor with your first baby the majority of the time right whereas usually you just kind of start labor closer to active labor with your second baby mm -hmm. and beyond so, mm -hmm. okay so after early or late in labor we move into active labor active labor is the dilation of the cervix about from eight six to eight centimeters or so I think, and some of the old charts, you'll see active labor starting at four centimeters. I definitely think that's cutting oh, it no. way too early, way too early. Uh, I mean, you could not be in labor and be four centimeters. <laughs> right. And changing the definition is helpful because um, it's not considered failure to progress or an arrest of labor if it's still early. And so what was happening was that they were considering four mm -hmm an arrest of progress at four centimeters in the hospital to be caused for augmentation. And then that was causing a lot of issues. So ch mm -hmm. changing the definition to six is actually really helpful from a cesarean uh, prevention perspective. Yes. Good. So, um, yeah, so about, I would say six to eight centimeters. What would you say for active labor? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's six to 10, but there's like the, the little section at the end too. That's right. something else, which we'll get to. Right, which we'll get to in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. six to nine. I mean, it just yeah. depends. It kind of just depends on what's happening. Yeah. But it's the period where it's ramping up. It is like close together, intense, and the progress is happening so much more quickly and predictably. Yeah. Yeah we're getting close to the end. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, uh, we'll usually see like some vocalization, you know, you might, somebody might kind of hum or maybe lightly make a noise in early labor, but not usually. Right. Usually we start seeing more vocalization and it's kind of taking all of your body and all of your attention to get through those active labor contractions. Yes. So for the birthing person, um, what do you suggest in active labor? Um, it depends on what's going on and what we're experiencing, but this is generally a good time to pull out your bag of tricks that you learned in your childbirth class. You know, yep. so. <laughs> so this is where you walk and maybe spend some time in the shower and do some stairs and, uh, do some of those sideline positions back and forth to get baby in a good position and you know all that stuff so we're generally active labor also means that the rest of us are active a lot of the time so we're doing a lot more direction and um, support if the doula is there same thing you know that's where the doula is working hard yeah if mm -hmm. um if you're planning to have a birth tip available this is usually a good time to fill it up Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a little bit of a um, point of diminishing return on the tub and getting in too early can not only slow down contractions, but it can also make it less effective when you really need it. So we usually wait until we're in a good active labor pattern before we suggest getting into the tub. Yep. Um, good. And we're going to circle back to what midwife should be doing in, in this or what we think midwives should be doing. Because <laughs> we are not an authority on what all midwives should do. Right. Um, okay, so then the end of the active labor, the, I mean, the, sorry, the end section of active labor, or the end section of even the first stage of labor is called transition. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're just finishing off, off that last bit of dilation. So it might be eight to 10 centimeters or nine to 10 centimeters, depending and on- And you know, when I, when I learned that 
um, for my Bradley certification was seven, you know, so, and that was back yeah. when it was four centimeters for, you know, like, all yeah, four stuff. to seven and seven to yeah. 10. Yeah. Um, transition's hard. Yo, we're not going to lie. This is the hard part. This yeah. is the part where almost everybody wants to give up. Almost everybody says, I can't do this. Almost yeah. everybody, um, they might not be saying it, but they're thinking, I'm not going to make it. Like, you just have this moment of thinking, like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. possible that I'm going to be able to do this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so learning to read those cues is a good, um, you know, it's a good tool to be able to figure out if we're getting to that point where you just feel really defeated. Yeah. Um, other things would be like vomiting, shaking. All of those are very common in act in uh, transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else do you see in transition? Um, sometimes people have loose stools, mm -hmm. uh, which is a thing that can be all through labor. Mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's just like those emotional signs, you know. So the yeah. discouragement, maybe some crying maybe some, um, I don't know, irritability. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then, yeah, all the, you just see people getting hot and cold and shaking and, yes. and, um, you might start to feel some pressure. So you have, especially with those first babies, I see a lot where people are feeling pushy quote unquote, you know, but it's not true. Uh, pushy yet and so you know so we fight that a little bit as the baby's head's coming down but we're not ready to push yet yeah that's a good point um mm -hmm. first babies usually you're usually your baby is close to being engaged with the first baby most of the time at the onset of labor so we often have a much lower head earlier sometimes weeks before labor mm -hmm. and that's great because that helps spread the pelvis it helps the baby's head mold um, it does a lot of good work before labor even starts, but it leads to a lot of pressure and rectal sensations and stuff like that, which are, um, they're intense. It's an intense yeah. thing to feel that. Um, good. Okay. So as the midwife, what would you suggest? Well, as an experienced midwife, what would you suggest to, um, other midwives or student midwives in, um, early labor? What would be your, you know, what do you think the midwives usually and we'll talk about these exceptions later yeah. usually should be doing so i mean get good at screening which does come with experience um, and even then you still get it wrong sometimes but um get good at screening for the stages of labor so the person that is calling and breathing through their contractions because they're really well prepared for this and they're super intense but because they prepared so well they're just breathing, chances are that person is still not in active labor if they're not vocalizing. So I mean, mm -hmm. you just have to get good at really listening to those cues. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I mean, just supporting people to try to, to ignore their labor early on, that is a really hard thing to do because it feels like you are not being supportive of their experience or something and um, but really really the best thing you can do for these people is get them to sleep just don't go over mm -hmm. there too early don't pay attention too early just sleep 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 because the hard work is going to come much later for most people mm -hmm. and once the midwife is there and the midwife team you know we would very rarely call our assistant midwife over at that point but if you have a student then it's you and the student and that just feels like a lot of excitement that the midwives are there. And um, it's pretty, um, it's actually, I think it's actually counterproductive. It, you have the watched pot syndrome. You have um, most, most women are kind of people pleasers and feel a pressure once the midwives are there to start performing for lack of a better word and we don't expect that but there's that pressure and it it really gets in their head and can in interfere with the ability to just sort of relax and get out of the way like dr bradley right. said and the hormones are really sensitive too so yes you can interrupt the progress of labor by having all of this activity going on you know um i do think it's important to remember that we 
are animals that want to go in a cave and labor in um, seclusion, you know, or with some support in the dark, at least, you know, without all this activity and yeah. um, so that our adrenaline doesn't kick in and all of that. So it's, um, it is It's important. actually funny that you say that because, you know, I had days of prodromal labor, days from Thursday till Sunday. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny that you say that because you've also said on, in other situations that I'm really sensitive to hormonal stuff going on in the room. Yeah. And I bet that I was just so in my head that that is what was keeping me from letting my body get into active labor yeah. or even early labor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's funny that you say that. I bet that's exactly what was going on with me. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it feels harsh. Sometimes it feels harsh to be the one to show up to somebody's house and say, so you're doing really great you're doing good work, you're making good, um, you know, all of this is really good and it's preparing for the baby, but it's too early. You need to get some sleep and we're gonna leave. And, um, but I do think it's really important and I encourage my students to, you know, not, because you could be there for days and I was there for days at so many births, but oh, yeah. it was just way too early. Yeah, I mean, it happens. I mean, I just did that recently uh, because, you know, you get, you have, when you have people that have had babies before, it gets a little trickier with discerning the different things. And and I had one where I got, was there like way too early and I ended up just sleeping in my car because I just didn't want to go home and decontaminate and, you know, all of the things. And mm -hmm. it was fine. It worked out fine because luckily we can also know that people that have had babies before at some point are going to ramp up, you know, and Mm -hmm. so it's and sometimes we choose to be there early. Sometimes yeah. we might choose to be there, quote unquote, too early if somebody did precip before or had a precipitous birth. Sure. If we've suggested castor oil for somebody, we might choose to go and just hang out. But it's still better to get out of their space. So it's better to sleep in your car. This is part of my thing about why I want a camper van. <laughs> right. Because I could be there without being in their space. And it is just like that watched pot syndrome. They're just waiting you know, everybody's just waiting for something to happen. And that's not, um, yeah. it's not and usually it's the better best. just for every, in those situations, it's better for everyone to be able to go to bed and right. including the laboring person, you know, even though they're probably going to be waking up every five minutes, but it's right. still better to be resting and not worrying about all the other people. Yep. Absolutely. And then active labor. What's, what are we doing in active labor? So generally we want to be heading in the direction of the person's house if they're getting into active labor. And so that's what we usually try to shoot for. So as a midwife, I'm listening for that vocalization with the contractions. And it has, I mean, these all have really distinctive sounds. So, you know, so you just have to have a practiced ear. And, um, and then what else? Like the pattern, we want them to be three to five minutes apart, lasting a minute for an hour is what, you know, is the general rule, although there's tons of variability with that. And uh, they don't change with um, change of activity. They're consistent. Um, you know, of course, they feel like they need a lot of support at that point, mm -hmm. you know. So um, some people want a lot of support earlier just because they don't, you know, they've never done this before and they don't know what's, what's going to be coming down the road. But when you've got um, experienced birthers and they're feeling like they need support, that's a good indication too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're, we as the midwives are providing some of the support. We're definitely providing emotional support. Um, we are providing some of the physical labor support, the hands-on stuff, but we are also, um, we have a lot of other stuff to do. We have, we're doing a lot of monitoring. We're checking vitals. We're listening to heart tones. We're setting up our stuff, our trays, our equipment, making sure everything's in a working order. And then we are also um, needing to conserve our energy a little bit, especially if we're not sure, you know, obviously if this is a birth, you know, maybe this is somebody who has three hour labors and we're on hour two of their three hour labor, we have good cause that we're not going to be up all night. Although that has also, you know, bit me in the rear end before, mm -hmm. but, um, but we do have to think about our energy management ourselves. And so sure. 
we need to take breaks, we can't do continuous hands-on support. So here's where a doula is really great to have somebody who can, especially if, boy, if they really like hip squeezes and counter pressure on the sacrum, it's really nice to have somebody that's really assigned to that. And the partner can do it for a long time, but also probably not continuously. Right. Ooh, those hip squeezes and the counter pressure. So Biceps. So exhausting. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, lots of work. So we're finding a balance between providing support. It's often in the form of emotional support and giving somebody, uh, giving other people roles. So, right. hey, exactly. she really likes it when you push like this. Here you go. And right. then managing our energy a little bit. And then in the time of COVID, we're also taking mask breaks. We're going outside. We're taking off our masks, getting some fresh air so that we're not um, in the house with a mask on for... 18, 20 hours. Mm -hmm. um, good. And then in transition, what role do you see the midwife playing? So, you know, again, depending on the situation, sometimes at this point, the midwife might be with the laboring woman for the rest of the duration of mm -hmm. the labor. Um, sometimes not. Sometimes trans transition lasts longer than we think, but it's um, generally pretty short. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's um, just a lot more verbal support, encouragement, hang in there, we're almost there, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's, it's really a lot of times like the high contact period where you're like, okay, no, you know, we're almost here, we're almost there, mm -hmm. let's just, mm -hmm. let's just get through and um, you can do it. And sometimes it's just eye contact, it's just, you know, yeah. you know, making that connection and and yeah. being there and just like, I, I, I got you. I mean, I know this is really, really hard. I've been there myself. Yeah. Like, it's just that like, yeah. Uh, sympathy even more mm -hmm. than empathy. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then of course you're right. That is, we're more hands, you know, we're all hands on deck at that point. Usually, um, we're not necessarily taking so much of breaks. We do, you know, if it lasts a long time, you probably do want to rotate out for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. But it is more yeah. of a rotation thing where, cause so much could happen. You know, this is where the water's likely to break. We need to listen to heart tones more often. You know, there's just a lot, a lot. Plus happening. as one of my beloved midwife friends says, it's never too late for the baby to fall out. You know, you could have a really long transition period and all of a sudden the baby comes out, even in a first time parent. It's so true. yeah, mm -hmm. so it's really, that's where we really are like right on it. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, that's it for the first um, installment of our, because <laughs> we're going to move into the second stage of labor, which is pushing in the next podcast. So anything else that we forgot that you want to wrap up? I don't know. All right. Well, tune in next week for the, not the conclusion, the, um, what's it called in a, like act two or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> for act two. <laughs> um, all right, everybody, follow us on social at Metro Midwifery or check us out at www.modmidwives.com. And we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.